Welcome, friends, to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities around the globe. Today, we're jumping into the northwest of the United States with our special guest today, Tyler, who runs a bunch of events and plays a bunch of different teams. Welcome, Tyler. Hey, how's it going? Hopefully, it's going really well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, super Sounds busy. Like- You've got a lot of big stuff coming up. I know I while I was looking into the Tacoma scene for the Goonhammer article, your name came up. And that's when I think when we first got connected, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it sounded um, like you guys have a pretty big scene, 40, 50 players coming up at um, one of your upcoming events, Kill Scream? Uh, 64. So. 64, yeah, that's a big one. Are you guys doing a two-day event with six, seven rounds? So it's a one-day, four-round event for pretty much everyone. And then... The so we do a top eight cut at the, the end. I mean, that's what we're going to end up with eight undefeated round four. And then the top four will come back the second day for like their own shadow round. Um, we, so the, the event kill stream um, wasn't really expected to be this large. Um, like we knew we had some momentum following Tacoma, you know, our events have been growing and stuff, but um, we had to bump it up to 50 people to accommodate. And we're actually at max size for the room um, yeah. that we're in. So sounds, sounds great, really. It's incredible. Um, yeah. The community's outpouring uh, and support has been absolutely astounding. Yeah, and it sounds like you've been instrumental in building up that local community out there in the Seattle Pacific Northwest area. I know that you played against Chris Baki, you know, U.S.'s number one last year at last year's Tacoma or Seattle Open, I think. And, yeah. you know, took second against his first, letting him get, you know, get his ticket into the championships. But you've also been playing Legionary, Hand of the Archon. And we're, you know, we're here to chat about all things Seattle and Pacific Northwest. Absolutely. Um, I think we have a pretty vibrant and exciting scene up here. Um, and I think it's slightly different um, in some ways. And we can cover that, um, you know, from the, the rest of the country and what I look at. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to hear about that. Um, any uh, teasers right off the bat of uh, what makes it different? So I think that, like, we, we have a very elite um, scene. Up here. So, like, I not like we, we trend towards elites. So you see a lot of Phobos, a lot of Legionary, a lot of Intercession. Um, extremely popular teams. I mean, just, like, across the board. They're the, the highest represented. Um, but I think we have, a, like, a lot of high skill cap players out here um, for those teams specifically. Um, I see people playing them um, and placing pretty high at events out here um, that are, I would say, comparable skill level to, you know, other other people I'd see in other places um, with them. So, yeah, I think that's like the, the really big thing. Just a lot of a lot of really top level elite players out here. Yeah, that's actually a pretty big difference, I think, from I think the majority of the metas. I think last weekend what at Nova, which I just got back from, I think, you know, it was really just commandos all the way down where I think the in the top eight, there was like five commando players just because uh, all the boards, because we were using the turning point tactics uh, mission pack, they all every board had three pieces of heavy basically across the middle of the board, which is basically just like the perfect commando nesting ground. So it made it very hard for any of the elites to really get too much started on open. I think on in the dark, the second place player, Shane, he was able to basically dismantle most of the commandos on in the dark because three, five profiles are substantially worse than four, five profiles. Yep. So I think there's a lot of that. I'm curious how your meta has been adapting to Chaos Cults, Felgor, and now the Commando Menace, basically. So, I mean, like, I think Commandos have always been an incredible team. I think that their rise to the top is, is twofold. Like you said, it's the map pack. Um, but also, like, the, the nerfs kind of all coming together have created a, a really just solid base for them. Um, they can set up such an oppressive early board state um, and just like really control a lot of stuff, you know? Um, as far as Colts, like they had come out right before Tacoma, you know? Um, and we had a couple really solid players with them, um, but they just kind of, uh, they got outmaneuvered a little bit by other players who were prepared for them um, and they couldn't come back. Uh, I think that 
the Pacific Northwest also tends to uh, kind of like self-regulate in a lot of ways. Like uh, when Pathfinders were broken and there was that soft ban on them, you know, like that's kind of stayed in place. We don't really see a whole lot of really aggressive Pathfinder players. Colts and Felgor, um, a lot of the top players out here actively avoided them um, for Tacoma because they didn't they didn't want the the feeling of winning with them. You know, um, we are yeah. extremely competitive, but I think that we're very much based on building community first and making sure everyone's having a good time. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely always a worry when it comes to these extremely strong meta teams. I know, Jason, you're I'm sure you're seeing ran into the issue. I know a lot of players locally in the Brooklyn scene were kind of not really the most enthused when Felgor and Chaos Colts were really strong. So I don't think we have a soft band because our the New York scene is pretty competitive. So people were playing them, but you still had to play them well for them to be good. It's just Chaos Colts were very, very forgiving at that time period. Um, you know, I think that so we had like one really top player, Brandon Bean, um, playing Chaos Colts. He he played an extremely tight game into me round three on the first day, and he gave me my my only loss at Tacoma. Um, and then the next day, I think his first round was up against Matt, and Matt obviously won the whole event. Um, phenomenal player, um, really really strategic. Um, he's going to make you work for everything. And if you mess up, he's gonna he's gonna capitalize really hard on it. And he saw that opening and just hit Brandon really hard, and he couldn't come back from that. Um, Did you, you know, manage to catch a catch part of that game and see what happened? Was it like a really big turn one, turn two play? I think it was a really big turn one play. Um, I think that he had ran an intercessor gunner with the aspects, so he could do a no obscuring shot. Um, and basically just set up and there was a slight mistake and got got a shot in and took out some really important key models first activation. Yeah, probably on an open board, I assume. Yeah. Um, so the Pacific Northwest um, Tacoma was all open and then we don't play into the dark out here. Um, oh, hey, that's actually a big meta thing. You should have led with that one. I mean, I, I get to that. You know, we, we like to that's that's pretty spicy. Um, a lot of people get weirded out when we say that so we love the spice that actually ties right in with one of my questions what do you do for terrain like are you following like any kind of like terrain packs or like did you make your own or um Mm. how's that looking so um i personally and I, i think as a group we don't really believe in map packs um they're cool for some people um but generally our events are 24 um, like for most of them as we've been growing our community. And so every round, me and my other like primary two TOs, we'd go around and we would reset every single board, every single round um, between them. So bespoke set up for every mission. Um, for these larger ones, um, so we got a 30 man this weekend um, and we're going to do kind of like Tacoma did, it's going to be a set board with different kind of objective layouts on it, same mission for everyone. And then you'll rotate through. So numbers will change. So top table's not always playing the same map, yeah. essentially. That's um, my favorite way of doing larger tournaments. It just lets you rotate and have each board already kind of designed rather than dynamically switching every round, which sounds like a lot, but it sounds right. cool. Uh, you know, like, I think that as we've evolved and grown, uh, we have a lot more flexibility. Um, you know, we've acquired as a club a lot of terrain. I personally have acquired a lot of terrain um, and the ability to just kind of like do single setups and stuff like that and not have to move stuff around um, has become easier. And our knowledge as TOs has grown, so we feel more comfortable in setting up stuff and making sure it's, you know, good for everyone and it's going to work great for the event. Yeah. Where do you guys get your events set up? Are you mostly um, finding players on Discord through your local, maybe kind of like bulletin boards? Tell us a little bit about how you've been gathering the community, because it sounds like the community has been popping off. So clearly Uh, me and Jason should be following your lead. uh, So I think that we're the sixth largest kill team community on Discord um, out there. Um, So I think it's like Spain and then we got Glass and then Command Point. Battle Brothers and or Crit and then Battle Brothers and then I think it's Kill Team Cascadia. Um, 
we've got 350 members and so our recruiting is strictly word of mouth um nothing else uh we don't do any other kind of promotion really you know like you'll see me post events other places um or like kill team related projects i'm working on to kind of shill um because i think it's exciting yeah i'm not just trying to push stuff but um chill away tyler yeah um but like yeah it's all just like word of mouth um i kind of like cut my teeth on the the punk scene as a a youth and so like i don't know if you guys have ever ever were involved in that or, or into it there'd be like flyers and it'd say ask a punk um to like find out where a concert is and stuff like that and so i kind of like take that diy ethos into a lot of community building that i do um you know like people have been asking me for like a qr code and i'm like even like oh i don't know guys like that's that's like i like it when you have to just do that extra little step Um, you're adding the little bit of friction to make that human connection exactly and i think um i think in the like for the community size that we have it works really well um, I think if you were trying to build a national brand or something like that, or if I was trying to go much larger, I would obviously have to do things um, in a different way. But for what we're trying to achieve of a really tight community out here, I think it works really well. And are you mostly doing tournaments or do you have narrative campaigns or you know tie-ins with other communities, maybe like an infinity group that you know, started playing a little bit of Kill Team because you guys saw, or is it mostly just like Kill Team players meeting other Kill Team players in the greater Pacific Northwest area? Uh, basically, that's it. Um, you know, like we like, I think we have members. So like our group was formed post Seattle last year. Um, I took top spot as we, we covered it for the locals, essentially. And so they kind of strapped me with the duty to gather us all up and So we were spread out like there was two of us in Salem, Oregon that were playing pretty regular. There's like one person in Portland, maybe two people and like 10 others, you know. Mm -hmm. And from there, like we created our discord and it was completely private, just like a few of us in there at first. And we kind of like figured out what what we wanted to do as a group. Um, You know, I we got some art done up and basically like um, people who contributed to that, like became like the first like wave of kind of the founders of the group. Um, And then kind of had a little bit more say and influence. And then we just started recruiting people, Um, DM people on discord. They talk about kill team, you know, or we'd go meet up with them for a game, invite them in. They'd invite their friends, stuff like that. Um, And soon we had like people, in Portland, you know, there'd be like a game night popping up and stuff like that at different stores. Um, and our like real goal is to like kind of work with stores to help them build a community so that we can all play kill team, you know, um, and just like play better than we were a year ago, which we definitely are. Kind of sounds like Jason's group, huh? Yeah, definitely. Um, so when it comes to the the discord and like how big it is do you have any cool like design philosophies on what kinds of channels you have and things like that to, to that like do you think the discord has catered to the growth or any like anything like that at all um so i think like kill team is best on discord um any kind of discussion or community building is best on discord stuff like reddit and facebook are too stagnant um, for something as dynamic as Kill Team, um, which is interesting because, like, you can discuss 40K online and it's, you know, it makes sense. But for some reason, Kill Team in these dead spaces or these, like, non-live interactable spaces doesn't ever really take off. Um, You look at, like, Reddit's Kill Team and it's not great. Um, It's impossible to, like, organize anyone on there. And so I think, like, when you get people in your Discord, it's really just, like, making sure that conversation's going on and that you are aggressively inclusive um, about everyone. You know, like, Wargaming can be a really intimidating space for women and queer people. And, like, having 
um, it up front that first they're an important part of your community, um, that they're valued and that like it's a safe spot for them to come and take part. Really good. Um, I think that the Pacific Northwest scene is exceptionally queer as a group. Um, and I love it. I don't think that our group would be quite the same without everyone in it who is here. That sounds very, that sounds great. Honestly, you know, New York's got a big LGBTQ community, I think in D and D, but definitely not as much in the wargaming side. It's been hard to, it's been hard personally for me to like reach out and be like, Hey, you want to paint up some miniatures and play a game with, you know, 15 other guys in a room for three hours. So it's really cool to hear of another community that's been doing it pretty well. It sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, like it's definitely like super important to me, just like, you know, I, I think that we're all at a point where pretty much any rational person cares about equality. Um, and wargaming is one of those spaces that um, is not always that inviting. So making it inviting really, I think, helps grow the community, especially if there's a big LGBT community in your area. Do you have a handful of local shops that you work really close with and you're some of your other TOs are closer to that you guys all individually work at? Or do you guys kind of rotate? How's the how's the scene kind of been growing organically? Um, so we started off in like one shop, mostly in Salem, uh, Oregon, which is like where I'm based out of. Um, and we were playing there for a while and we actually got to outgrew the shop. Essentially, we were getting like 16 to 20 people weekly, just casual games. Um, every Wednesday night and a new shop was opening up um, and one of my friends part of the group drove by and like stopped in they weren't even open yet and he talked to the owner and we we moved in there as our primary shop Shiv Games. Um, Jeff the owner of Shiv Games has been an incredible partner to work with to help us grow. Um, He's really been fundamental to our success. Um, I think he gives us you know a spot to play he lets us host tournaments for free, um, so there's no fee for us. And then that, in turn, allows us to put everything that we get for entry fees towards prize support. Um, and then also charity, which is the other really big thing that we're about out here. It sounds in general like your whole scene is ahead of the game in, in a lot of elements in, the, in that regard. I, I mean, like, I think that it's been, like, you're seeing basically a year of extremely hard work by a group of us um, that wanted something and we've, we've made it happen. Um, You know, I think that, yeah, it's just that you got to have the, the people that want it. You got to have that, like, like I said, uh, or I don't know if we covered this. I think you have to have a a champion uh, for the group, like someone who really, really wants it a lot and will kind of, uh, be the person to speak out about it or be the face or whatever of the group. And I think that's me. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps the champion of the community has some hometown heroes they'd like to give a little shout out to. I think it'd be really cool for us to hear about some of your, like the people that help make it all possible for you. Cause I, I know personally, you know, I can, I do a lot of the work, you know, somewhat on my own, but having like your crew that backs you up is always great. And seeing players, you know, do well starting in your tournaments and then going to the GW tournaments and doing well, it's always very rewarding. So, you know, give us like, you know, a handful of players that you want to give their shout outs to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so like I would say that the, the two people that I rely on the most um, is Eric. Um, he's my like co-coordinator. He does a lot of like the back end uh, kind of like administrative stuff. Um, for us, he keeps us like on target um, for what we're trying to do. Project manager, essentially. And then our head judge, uh, Greg Marquino, he took second at Tacoma. Uh, f- dude is incredible. If he uh, if he takes a golden ticket ever, you all better watch out. Um, one of the best players I've ever played in my entire life. Um, I don't think I would be as good as I am if it wasn't for Greg. Um, and I don't think I've ever talked to or met someone that has quite the mind for the game like Greg. Truly phenomenal player. Um, and then up in Seattle, we got Max. Max is uh, one of our founders. And then Brandon. Um, love them both to death. Uh, wouldn't be able to do a lot of the stuff we do without them. So. 
Good to hear. I mean, it's one of the fun things about playing community driven games is making those connections and finding those friends that I think a lot of video games, it's just that much harder because you it's much easier to lose that connection when you're mostly just playing a video game, right? Absolutely. Um, I mean, video games are wonderful, but, uh, you know, like why I really enjoy tabletop games is like you have to make that personal connection. Uh, you have to stand across from someone and negotiate something. Um, that's like one reason I personally don't do tabletop simulator. Um, I play tabletop for the, you know, the social aspect. Um, we always say like with our events, your goal is to come and make four friends by the end of the day. And hopefully you win. Yeah. I mean, my goal is always come have fun and play a game. The fun is the first part. The game is the second part. And fairness is right up there, but you know, if you're not having fun, then what? Why? Why spend the time? Why spend the eight hours? Right? Exactly. Um, you know, like who wants to come to an event that's not fun? Um, yeah. One of the things that I've been interested in, you know, hearing you talk about how big your scene is, it doesn't seem like the Pacific Northwest is really mixing in too much with any of the other scenes at the moment. Is that is that correct, or am I just, um, you know, am I off? I mean, I think that's correct. We do we do have we do send out spies to events. I'd say, um, you know, we have some people that float out there um, to other events um, that you may see every once in a while. But they they're they're lurking midfield. They're those midfield sharks you got, um, and some of them have really really improved their their skill. But I think that the Pacific Northwest is just generally kind of an isolated region. Um, it's always been on its own for everything um, in a lot of ways. Um, geographically, you know, like we're pretty far away from California. And then you got Utah and Idaho um, next to us. And then so everyone, then Vegas, um, that's the next big stop. And so LVO and all of that. Are you um, guys planning to send a, a big LVO competition contingent we, out this year? We definitely have quite a few people from CATS coming out to LVO, myself included. So nice. um, I'm super stoked about it this year. Um, I got to meet and hang out with Dakota last year, um, and that was wonderful. Um, Dakota's been super cool to uh, to know, um, great to, to bounce ideas off of, um, stuff like that for, for yeah, events. He's a, you know, Luster's Workshop, sponsor of the channel, in case anybody wants to get their, you know, yeah. their measure and gauge. Absolutely. Uh, he's he's great, dude. Great stuff, too. Love his stuff. So, yeah, I mean, he did very well at uh, the Nova this last weekend. He uh, he went like a clean four zero veteran guard sweep on the first day and then, you know, was dropped into the losers bracket. But he seemed like he was having a great time. I, absolutely. I think he he did fantastic um, to take that guard into that field is just kind of rough also um, against those players like. That's just a lot. That guard is an incredible team. I could never play them. There's just too many models. 14's too much for me to, to deal yeah. with. I mean, that guard have basically just been an S tier team the entire game's life. So the fact that they've never been touched in any real meaningful way dedicatedly has been a personal gripe of mine. But they are very good, and it, it's good to see them still doing very well. I'm surprised, you know, when you talked about your t your meta being very elite heavy you know there's pathfinders veteran guard blooded are all kind of like elite hunters so you don't really have a lot of players playing these these factions really so i mean like we do have bean is so the guy I talked about earlier a few times um brandon bean that is uh he's a blooded player uh, i think he's the second ranked blooded player in the u.s um maybe the first at this point um really good blooded player um, he very likely could take kill scream. Um, he's extremely competitive, great player. Um, and he knows, he knows basically all the other people. Um, we've got, we don't have any pathfinders. Um, like I said, I would like to see some pathfinders up here, honestly, um, just to have more experience against them. Uh, but yeah, like, yeah, unfortunately it's... pathfinders are just, incredibly difficult i think for most like it is a very high finesse team and they're very squishy so when players aren't 
I think when you a lot of players I hear start playing Pathfinders, they're just gonna like demolish normally. Um, and it's just because you are very fragile, and if you're playing against a lot of elites and they just uh, shoot you early, you can lose a lot of your ability to set up the most powerful plays. So you, you have to play pretty patiently. And I think some players play it maybe a little bit too aggressively, so not the easiest team to pick up and play, unfortunately. Agreed. Extremely high skill floor and ceiling to, to play them well. Yeah. Um, oh, I was going to say, we do have some vet guard players up and coming um, that have picked it up fairly recently or picked up the team recently um and we do have some casterkin and a couple great hand of the archon players um out here so those are pretty good into elites um i think our meta has been diversifying since tacoma quite a bit um you know Everyone like part of the uh, six man elite mirrors yeah i think a lot of people are tired of that um but i think like the scene has kind of come into maturity since then um or like it was coming into maturity right around there you know, um, that's like really kind of we'd finished our like first little mini series of events um, right before Tacoma, like literally less than a week before it. Um, and the the growth in players from the beginning of that to the end was just incredible. And I think a lot of players were playing what they were used to um, at Tacoma. And now they're starting to switch it up into to a lot more aggressive and diversified teams. Sounds pretty exciting. And, you know, since you guys are playing on open, the whole game is feels like it's designed around there. So I'm sure your games are great. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's really good. The The skill level, like I said, just has gone through the roof. Um, night and day, completely different people um, playing the game. I mean, just uh, world class stuff, I think. Man. I mean, it'll be cool to see how well the Pacific Northwest does when you guys travel out to LVO. I assume it doesn't sound like you guys, anyone is going to the All Valley Team Tournament later this year with Dakota or even the SoCal Championships. So I think Dakota's uh, going to be giving us a uh, SoCal Championship uh, ticket for our winner of Kill Screen. So we will probably be sending someone down there. Um, we are not, I don't think anyone's going down for the All Valley, um, at least no one from Cats. Um, can make it. So. Yeah. And then LVO is going to be just a blast. I think that we will see some really strong finishes there. Yeah, there's a decent chance that uh, the Minnesota crew over here will will send out a little group to LVO again this year too, um, which is also my off season. So hopefully I can pull it off as well. You guys making me jealous. I wasn't planning to go originally, but oh yeah, LVO is fun. Um, of kind of like it's the fact that it lands in January makes it like the easiest event for me, like of all time. And like LVO with its cheaper flight tickets, and then just find a bunch of friends and sleep on the floor, make the hotel really cheap too. But you yeah. got to get that good sleep before LVO because it's it's going to be fierce this year. I you think know, uh, maybe that was my problem last time. For real, same. I. I got next to a, a partier room and like they were going to like four in the morning and then they were up back at it real early in the morning the next day. I did not sleep great. You know what the secret is? Earplugs. I like it. Yeah, I travel with earplugs and an eye mask so I can just like sleep anywhere, which does help when I'm going to tournament days. That's solid advice there. Yeah, it seems like we should maybe hit up some niche tactics with uh, with Tyler's uh, old favorite team. Yes, absolutely. Let's kick off the niche tactics. Um, niche tactics, for anyone that is unfamiliar, this is when we, we break it down, get into some deep dive tactics. And Tyler's got some experience with novitiates, which is something we haven't talked a lot about. So let's dive in. Niche tactics. Sounds yeah. great. You know, locally, one of my one of the people on my competition team, she's plays novitiates very well. And she's always described the team as a bunch of aura bubbles that she's juggling constantly all the time. So I was wondering, you know, does that kind of ring true for you or do you have a different play style that you've found success with on the novitiates? I mean, I definitely think that novitiates have a lot of auras going on. You know, you got to keep people in ranges like with your leader because you want to move your your medic afterwards. Um, you want to make sure that your defensive buffs are in place from the mace person. I yeah. novitiate may be my first love, but I can never remember their names. Yeah, uh, so the procedure, um, I think, is the, the person with the flaming mace. 
Yep. Um, Preceptor, she's got a three inch bubble where everyone can reroll one dice. And on a three up save, that one reroll does provide a lot of value. Absolutely. Um, and then it also has the the uh, the fighting aura too, fighting and shooting aura um, that can be very, very clutch um, at moments too. Um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of auras. You've got the, the Condemner with its minus APL aura, which is incredibly powerful. And that, that always catches people by surprise. Um, so I definitely think that there's the auras. Um, I think... I think of them as kind of like a trick and control team, um, personally, because they they allow you to control a lot of the flow of the game. You know, being able to move someone out and someone setting up for a shot and you're going, no, actually, you can't shoot me. Sorry. Um, is incredibly powerful. Or to go, actually, this hit is a crit and you die and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, yeah. The ability to do what you want when you need to is... I mean, that that's everything in this game. Consistency and control of dice and being able to execute on your plan is so powerful. Yeah, for listeners who have never played against Novitiates, which I'm sure is a fair number of players at this point, just because it is both a hard team and not, I don't think, a super popular team. They were doing very well last year in the meta, but the Novitiates' primary rule is Acts of Faith, which is basically a pool of points that you can use for a whole, I think there's eight different abilities. And the one that Tyler was referring to when he was referring to blocking a shot is the ability called Blinding Aura, which is as you go to get shot, you can spend some points and then your operative is treated as both a conceal order and being in cover, which means that unless you're within two inches, you can't shoot them. And at the floor, it is you can use them as just a tactical reroll. So you can think of Novitiates as a team with 10 operatives that have at their base 12 command point rerolls, which is a lot. And uh, beyond that, because anyone who's shooting pretty much, you're going to put an outer chastiser on. So they're already rerolling ones and they probably hit on twos, you know. So the team is just crazy, like that crazy consistent on the flamers. And the leader is easily the deadliest weapon in the game with that plasma pistol, you know, it will hit four shots every single time yeah. unless your dice just are cursed. And even, it will even if your dice aren't cursed, you know, you can still fix it. Exactly. Like, um, it's just crazy. Like it, the leader will delete one to two people each turning point, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, the Novitiate's leader, she's got a plasma pistol that you can use a strategic ploy, Eyes of the Emperor, which will make her plasma pistol a plasma gun. She hits on twos, and she can take an auto chastiser. She, she can reroll ones. So she is four attacks on twos, five, six, AP two, ceaseless. So basically, she just puts four shots down every time. Um, yeah, it's just crazy. She's just nuts. So do you have any other set plays that you like doing? Uh, you know, I know that people talk about having the medic sit next to the leader so that the leader can take a safe shot and get back into cover. And I also know that people use the preceptor to line up within that same bubble. So even if she gets shot, she can take a couple extra hits. What other plays or, you know, fancy things have you done with the team that you found success with over, over time? So I think one of the things that really gets overlooked uh, about the team, and Chris pointed this out to me, um, after our game, is that the the banner lady, she actually has eight wounds, um, not seven. Uh, so she's slightly more durable, but she also has that like cool little uh, little bubble, the aura. We're going back to the auras. And if anyone dies near her, they get to shoot. Um, so sometimes if you set up right, you can run your leader up. You can shoot someone and kill someone. Run your medic up, get them in position. Then, you know, just get off double shots. Um, or if it's late in the game and you need to make those important kills, you know, just sacrifice your leader. Um, if it's an elite team and you've already killed enough of them, it doesn't matter, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think when my novitiate player locally was struggling against the elites, she was saying that, you know, the elites are one of the harder matchups because without your leader, you're not really able to crack the three-up armor save. Did you find that to be the case or did you have plays that you found very useful against elites so i think that before the nurgle nerf into legionary um it was really hard i mean like 
you know, it, it just basically stopped um, their ability to, their mutagenic flesh did, um, to be able to put any serious damage on them with anything other than the plasma. Um, and I think Intercession are still, I mean, Intercession are just an incredible team, um, period, you know. So I think that that's a difficult matchup just in general. Um, the durable nerf is obviously really good for everyone, um, and especially novitiates, because you can pile on those crits if you have to um, with them. But I definitely think it's not, they're not easy matchups by any means. Um, they can definitely hurt novitiates quite a bit. And I think that legionaries are kind of why we saw novitiates drop out of the meta largely last year yeah um, how would you approach those matchups you know nowadays because i'm sure other novitiate players have you know struggled with the matchup how would you approach it or what things do you think players who are playing against novitiates could do better against novitiates so i think like novitiates first you, you got to kill the cup lady um you got to kill whoever's holding the the chalice scoring those faith points um you gotta you gotta force them to burn them and you gotta put them in rough positions um and then i think for novitiates players it's really you just can't let elites get in close on you um if you overextend yourself or you let them you know push you too hard it's going to be a bad time once elites get into you it's it's real rough especially if they're doing stuff like shoot charge or like shoot shoot charge you know and then you have to spend two apl to to get out of that um really rough for for novitiates i feel like especially if they're locking up your damage dealers like your your leader or your your flamers stuff like that so really worried about the midline approach of the elites when you're playing novitiates Absolutely. Um, I think that Novitiates are definitely a team to play on security. I think that their tech ops really allow them to do that well. I think that the Chalice Lady, um, you know, she just wants to sit on a point and hold it so that you can max your your primaries and stuff like that. So um, definitely, like, you need to you need to hold them back, not let them forward, but probably not take that tack op. Um, and you know, keep enough pressure that you you can hold all of your stuff with them and not just let them push you real hard. All right, all right. That's definitely some good advice, I think. Do you have any other teams that you want to, that you have any niches that you want to explore while we're on the pod together? You know, I honestly, I don't feel like I play as much as I would like these days. Um, a lot of my time is spent doing organizational stuff. Um, Kill streams come about really fast. Um, you know, like it, it's a big event, period. Um, but like the whole thing is less than two months from like announcement to go. Um, and so that's crazy fast. And we're we're trying to get a lot of stuff out before then. Um, and then. Yeah. Tell, tell would, us a little bit more about a uh, kill screen for anyone who doesn't know. You know, give us the date, give us the you know location and you know, talk, it, talk it up a little bit. Okay, so uh, it's October 14th in Portland, Oregon at Guardian Games. Um, there are generous hosts this time. Um, they are providing the space for free for us um, to have this wonderful event. Um, super, super awesome. Uh, and it's going to be, a, like we've said, four rounds um, and then a shadow round the following day for the top, top four. We're giving away a sword to the winner. Um, kind of celebrate, you know, like trophies, cool but a sword's cooler. Um, and it's kind of a horror theme. We kicked off our last event, our first event last year, right around Halloween. And I'm, I'm kind of I'm just a big nerd in general. Uh, I like horror movies and heavy metal. And so that's kind of been the theme for the year. And so we're celebrating it. And we're doing, you know, just like the best sequel we can with it. Um, and through it, we've like... We're trying to like really make sure people have a lot of fun. Um, if you're not in the top top eight in the final round, we have a fun narrative mission for people. It's going to be a little bit different than a standard kill team game. So, 
All right, so players are mostly playing on the first day, and then the second day is for the top eight. Is that that's the format? Yeah, uh, top four. So oh, top four. Wow. Yeah. So, um, like I said, Kill Scream was never originally meant to be a two day event. Um, our first one was a one day competitive, one day narrative event, um, but we we just we're going to have a competitive one. Um, narrative. Just kind of outgrew that, huh? Uh, I mean, like, I like narrative, and we're keeping the narrative mission for optional for people in round four. Um, but it's just, narrative is so much work. It just yes. takes so much to do. It's like between the writing the mission, the acquiring of any extra models, painting, the setup, um, all of it together is just, like, very, very intense. Yeah, so. I think, you know, at the New York Open last year, I ran two different one day narratives with like a bunch of bonus rules. And at the end of it, I was like, ah, no, I'm not writing extra rules like this for uh, at this level again, just because it is a lot to try to have a unique experience. So this year, you know, for the New York Open, too, we have like three people kind of working together to drive through the two day narrative. So I'm excited to see how that plays out. Oh, that sounds really cool. Yeah. Unfortunately, it sounds like you guys are mostly staying up in the Pacific Northwest until LVO. Otherwise, I'd tell you to come out to the New York Open, even though you have I mean, the LA one right there. You know, like New York Open sounds great. Um, I, I'd love to come out to New York sometime. Get a, get a real New York slice. So. Yeah, yeah. Pizza's is great out here. Absolutely. Yeah, November 4th, 5th. In case you want to drag anyone else down, you know, we'd be happy to have you. No, I mean, like, it's tempting. It's very tempting. So... All right, friends, we're going to jump into another section here, the Operative Showdown. And this time, we're going to jump into the the previews and the, the rumors and what we know about Strike Force Justian. Operative Showdown. Yeah. Luckily, you know, this is a great Operative Showdown because it is literally just seven operatives compared to Intercession spread of Assault Intercessors with some special stuff and intercession warriors with a bunch of different guns this is a fixed roster of seven operatives that you get to pick six of and that's you know different from the intercessors in the past it looks like we will not be getting any new tack ops or any new strap poise or anything so i think right now my expectation is this team just runs with the intercession rules just with these seven data cards which also covers the equipment yeah unfortunately for players the equipment is baked in and it looks like we get a forp and vulnerable save on a, the captain we get a smoke grenade and then we get a bunch of sniper rolls absolutely i was surprised that the the captain is not not a little bit stronger he's a chonky boy he gets to hit on twos with his plasma pistol which is not something we have on the intercession squad because I believe the only plasma pistol you can take on Intercession Squad is a 3-up plasma pistol on an Assault Intercessor. So Captain Justian is a little bit better than the average Assault Intercessor Sergeant in that his plasma pistol hits on 2s and his Power Fist hits on 3s, which I guess is normal. The fact that he has both is a big deal, plus the 4-up and Vulnerable save. And like a plasma pistol going from 3s to 2s is, as we chatted about elsewhere in this episode, is definitely a big deal. Yeah, he also comes with the rights of battle. So as long as he's on the battlefield, you get an extra CP each turn. So this team gets to play with four extra CP over the course of the game. And that just happens when you're generating command points. So unfortunately, you can't use more than one doctrine a turn still. So you're probably going to be using that for Angels of Wrath and Wrath of Vengeance or Angels of Death and Wrath of Vengeance, which will be a lot freer on this team. So you don't have to budget quite as much. And just command rerolls. Yeah, and lots of command rerolls because without the extra equipment freedom, you are very fixed on you got to do the thing that your six operatives provide. It's looking like this team is a much more shooty version of the team compared to the intercession squad because I believe four of the data sheets are bolter discipline. Da- five of the data sheets are bolter discipline data sheets, and two of them are fighter fight sheets. I mean, that's not how y'all were running it out there, anyways. With intercession? I'm not going to lie. I didn't even bring the grenade guy. I want 100% shooty. On, I think on In the Dark, having a couple more assault intercessors is probably the way to go. Because once you get an assault intercessor into the front line and make it your opponent's problem, the other guys can generally crack sh- shots open. But on open, I think on open, yeah, more more shooting is probably fine. Mm-hmm. 
The Snubber doesn't have Bolter Discipline, does he? He does not. So blood, Brother Flavian, he's the coolest operative on the team because he's got a camo cloak and a bunch of silent profiles, and he can give himself no obscurity, which Jason loves. And he comes Absolutely. with three Bolt Sniper Rifle profiles. They're all heavy, they're all silent, and they all do slightly different things. If, uh, Tyler, you want to talk about which ones you think are probably going to be the ones that you use the most? I mean, that Mortis one looks pretty great for killing other elites there. And then, yeah. like, have a silent blast on there. That's pretty sweet, too. Um, yeah. I mean, like, it, it's pretty... I mean, I think they're all going to get used in just different situations there. I mean, like, I can see a use for every single one of them. You know, against just your seven wound or eight wound models, your executioner is going to be incredibly powerful. Balanced, you know, no cover and silent. No ability to return fire, basically. Going to be picking models off. And then you're Plus pretty much guaranteed. Obscuring. So so bonkers. I'm going to say, Brother Flavian sure does have a lot of flavor. Yeah, he's the Brother Flav of Flavor for sure. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know what these models are doing right now, Br Brother Flavian is the Phobos pattern, bolt sniper rifle model. He comes with a camo cloak, so he retains two saves instead of one. He can ignore obscurity for an action point, and he has three different heavy silent profiles. The first one is the Executioner. Four attacks on twos, three, four, balanced, heavy, no cover, silent. Which is great, as Tyler said, at chipping down seven wound models, just because you're going to reliably be putting down four hits, which is basically impossible to save for most five five up save models. Meanwhile, the Hyperfrag is four attacks on twos, two, four, blast, one which is arguably a lot harder to use than Blast 2, but still forces your opponent to position. So that'll always have a, a value spot if your opponent lines up for it. And then the Mortis round is the anti-elite round, which is four attacks on twos, three, three, AP one, and mortal wounds three, along with heavy and silent, which can definitely put a crack in power armor if your opponent is not careful. You know, I hadn't noticed it was AP one and mortal wounds three. That's pretty spicy. Yeah. That's so, you know, spicy. on a Devastator Doctrine turn, he is going to be dumping five dice on twos, which is probably going to be really good. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, luckily they don't have smoke for all of us. Oh, yeah. No, only Brother Thysaur gets to chuck a smoke, and he gets it one time a game, but it is just the normal smoke, and he comes with a bolt rifle, four attacks on threes, three, four, P1, and can shoot twice with Bolter Discipline. I think that's enough. Just like one smoke grenade is all you need. Like, you can really wreck someone's day with one smoke grenade if you do it right. Absolutely. I think uh, the coolest profile, I think, you know, Brother Flavian, he's one of the more unique profiles because he only has 12 wounds. But on the flip side, Brother Acules, he picks up all the leftover wounds that <laughs> Flavian threw away as a heavy, or what is it, a heavy intercessor. So fixed from the compendium rules where they had three, three or six movement, but only two APL. He has the proper 3 APL now, but he only can move 4 inches a turn. But on 18 wounds, that's not so bad. Then they made his heavy bolter the exact same thing as the heavy bolt rifle from the compendium. So, no. It is much worse because it is a heavy bolter with only 4 shots. So that does oh, and suck. It is heavy too, isn't it? It is heavy. But, you know, 4 <laughs> dice on 3s, 4, 5, P1... If you roll eight dice, you're probably going to get a crit, so it'll probably dump enough dice to kill something, but four dice on threes is definitely a far cry from the five dice on threes that other heavy bolters get to play with. Generally, those ones cost CP, so maybe that's the balancing point on Brother Acules, but I do I do like look at it and kind of am sad. I, I wonder if they're going to FAQ that, because it's five shots on the heavy bolter. Come on. Well, uh, you know, like, this isn't even as good as, like, a a regular bolt rifle with uh, blessed bolts and a scope here. Yeah, I think the problem is without the suspensor equipment, Brother Acules is probably going to get left up by the wayside unless your map allows you to have a vantage point early up that actually does something, which I think the majority of mission packs and players have kind of moved away from an easy-to-get-to vantage point that just, like, dominates the board. So it's like, he's just going to have a miserable time setting up. Because... Since it's heavy, you can't move, shoot, and then run away. That's just not not allowed. He's just I mean, to he, stand he, out in the open and hammer people with big bullets. He could barely make it on top of a piece of Octarius terrain, though, with that two-circle movement. You he know? can make it up. Like, he just can't shoot on that same turn, unfortunately. Just barely. Just <laughs> maybe he has to like, start 
all up on the wall. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I'm I'm assuming that, you know, brother or Sergeant Marius and brother Vignus and brother Thysor are probably going to get a lot more work done than Acules just because they are normal assault or normal intercessor moves. One of the cool things, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen the backside, but basically you pick six out of these seven models and then you select either Sergeant Marius or Captain Justian to be your leader. So you can actually have both on your team. You're not restricted to one. So it, you actually do get a higher bullet six kill average, I think, across the team that you would on the intercessors because Sergeant Marius is a 15 wound model. So plus one because he's he is like a sergeant, but he also hits on twos with his bolt rifle. So while you're not getting the power of the intercession squad where you get four or five bolter shots, you at least are getting a lot more ballistic skill too in this team. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I think the sniper, that the... the sergeant and the captain. And um that's there's not there's it's those three with ballistic skill too, right? There's not yeah. another one. Yeah, that's still two more than you would get on intercession squad. So it yeah, is super an good. actual increase. I wouldn't call it as I wouldn't say that it's an equivalent exchange for the equipment loss, but it's not nothing. I think that this team's ultimately going to be very good for the game. Um, it seems like a perfect team for new people. We teach on intercession out here, which is probably one of the reasons that we have so many elite players. Um, you know, someone's brand new, we're going to teach them the game with intercession. And then they usually buy intercession and play it for a minute. Um yeah. As long as this box is available for people to to scoop up the models and stuff like that, I think that it will be a very, very great team for the game. Yeah, I think the good thing about this team is like this is a dead easy kit bash too. like if you bum around the 40k players, I'm sure you can pick up, you know, uh, one heavy intercessor and one eliminator relatively easily. Yeah, I actually Absolutely. already have all of these models. Like, I I have this, I have a cool, like, I don't know if he was an intercessor or a captain, but, like, he's got a cape and he has a fist and he has a plasma pistol already. And uh, I've got, like, a squad of heavy intercessors. I've got two squads of eliminators. Of course, I've got intercessors. So, like, I'm already ready without even needing to get any models. And uh, it would be easy to to do that for a lot of people, like Travis was saying. Yeah, Absolutely. ultimately, ultimately, I agree. This seems like a really good starter team that, you know, doesn't really break any. I, I would be extremely surprised if this somehow breaks the meta because the loss of the chapter tactics is a really, really big hit between this team and uh, Intercession Squad. Huge. Absolutely yeah. massive. But, I don't think that the chapter tactics are like um, something that can be overlooked. I mean, like it, they are such a defining feature of that team. No, I think getting, you know, four extra CP over the course of the game is not going to make up for the times when Durable saved your model or Rapid got you into a position to actually do something like Brother Acules with, you know, the extra with a suspenser and the ability to move an extra inch. He'd be really scary. But the way he is right now, he's just he just exists. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, but overall, you know, Brother Flavian, he looks really cool. You know, ha being able to hit on twos with a, sni a sneaky guy is, you know, definitely a cool model. You know, there's not too much going on with the team. There's like kind of a weirdness in that Brother Vignius has an auto bolt rifle and everyone else has, has the normal bolt rifles, which is a little odd. But I think I would have really liked to see one extra assault intercessor on the squad just so that this would have a little bit more play on In the Dark when you actually just want the extra extra guy that can do melee. That's what Captain Agreed. Justian's for. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Captain Justian's there to take names. I, I think, you know, Captain Justian looks very, very good. A 3-up save with 15 wounds and a 4-up invuln, that's going to be a tough nut to crack. So I'm, I'm excited to see this team kind of make it out. Unfortunately, this is part of GW's uh, Space Marine Heroes series. So for any players who are hearing this and it sounds cool, I would probably just go get spare models rather than trying to get the exact models from the gotcha system because you never know with a blind box if you're going to get the model you need. So who knows if you get two Captain Justians and no Brother Flavians, that would be that would just be a disaster. I think as long as you buy a box, you get all of them and then yeah. one duplicate in there. Yeah. So. I think the worry is how often are you going to find one box versus like someone just like, oh, I just want to get one of these blind boxes and it just disappears. I, yeah. You know, one thing I love about the hero stuff, we give it out as sportsmanship every single round um, for our events. So like 
whoever we think like is demonstrating exemplary sportsmanship, we'll hand them a Space Marine Heroes box. Um, yeah, that's great. This sounds like a perfect way to do it too, because these come with like data cards. Absolutely. You know, we were doing it with the the Plague Marine ones a while back, but you know, beautiful models, but no no data cards, no direct kill team plan. Now it's perfect. You know, honestly, if I would I would think that if this model does well for GW, this could be a really nice way to get more people both into kill team and provide a little bit more value for these Space Marine Heroes boxes. Just because like you know, it would have been cool to get a re-release on these really sick Death Guard models that no one couldn't get a hold of. But if they did it like this, then all the Kill Team people would be like, oh, let's go. Even if the team was kind of like trapped on Compendium tier like abilities, it would still be nice to get a little bit of equipment baked in with some cooler rules. Absolutely. I think that just as a format for releasing the team's really good. Um, you know, you buy a buy a blind box or a set of blind boxes and you got a team with everything you need. Um, pretty cool. Because, like, even with Kill Team, uh, as opposed to 40K, you buy the models and you don't have the rules for them. Whereas at least 40K gives you that base data sheet in the, the instructions. Yeah. All right, let's go around the table. What is your favorite operative and why, Tyler? Oh, man. Uh, I, I think I like the... Uh, Crimson Duelist for Hand of the Archon. I oh, I was just... talking. I was talking about from <laughs> the Shark Force Justian. Oh. <laughs> just in general, I, I, okay. Uh, I mean, like Flavius, you know, like or Flavian right. uh, sniper rifle is just so cool. Everyone's wanted. Everyone's wanted the Phobos team uh, in, like, to have the the Eliminator sniper, and we didn't get it. So now we're finally getting what we've we've wanted. Jason. Um, you know, I feel like it was probably pretty easy for all of us to say him, um, but maybe I'll go with the hipster choice and I'll say the heavy intercessor just because the heavy intercessor model is cool. Um, it's a shame that he's not that good, but I'll probably attempt to use him until I give up. But I mean, I don't know, four five P1, not horrible. Yeah. I mean, double shooting with eight dice. That's not bad. Yeah. The extra wounds are helpful, too. You know, I guess I, you know, I'm left with uh, Captain Justy, and I think he definitely it looks very, very cool. <laughs> like having a four up save on one of these chassis does sound kind of miserable. It's just lucky that he doesn't get chapter tactics because if he had durable, whew, it'd be impossible to kill. Yikes! All right, well, you know that's Strike Force Justy and everyone. For anyone who hasn't seen it, you know the pictures are out there, and hopefully soon the blind boxes will be in your hands too. Well, that has been it's been wonderful having you, Tyler, and. Listeners, thank you for listening all the way until the end. Before we leave, do we have any other final shout outs? I think we've pretty thoroughly covered everything, but there's we've got to shout out our Discord and our Patreon at the very least, if anyone's made it this far. That's absolutely true. Which I guess we've yeah. just done. So, yes, we have our own Discord and we have a Patreon, and you can get in on the action. Yeah, thanks for uh, coming on. It's really, it's really, really cool to hear from the Pacific Northwest. And obviously, your scene has been doing very well. So I'll try to take some of those notes to my scene. Absolutely. Um, I mean, like, if you ever want to talk organizing or growing scenes, I'm always happy to do it. Um, I always like talking people, kill team, and other stuff too. Um, so if anyone wants to reach out to me, feel free. Um, you know. we'll add you to our discord and if any one of any of our newer players wants to give you a ring maybe you can uh, catch up with us there absolutely um yeah i do have one more thing to plug if i could oh yeah go for it um we just kill team cascadia just released i think the sickest merch out there we have it up for pre-order right now um some really cool chaos legionary shirts hand-drawn art um by an artist named adam kindred um, super crazy, cool stuff. And then we have some really cool objectives available um, right now, too. That's sick. You should send us a link and we, I can put that in show notes. Heck yeah. I'd appreciate it. Um, I think the, the shirt's just so cool. The way it came out is amazing.